Wait, Phil, wait. Just Lance, just real quick before you go, and I just want to make sure where we press the record button on this. Are we recording this? I just started the record. We're good. Great. Sweet. Thank you, Chuck. So all of these brokerages are members of a best practices group called Blue Ocean. We are the top companies in the Western region for Coldwell Banker affiliated offices. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a great group. Obviously, uh, the fact that we're part of this group is because of all the sales associates and your contributions in, and production to all of this. And we're very grateful for all of that. We also are extremely fortunate this morning to have who I finally call the sweetheart of the California Association of Realtors with us. Her formal title, however, is Vice President and Chief Economist for CAR. And moreover, she is considered one of the, the brightest minds in our, in our space and one of the leading real estate economists in, in our country. We are extremely fortunate to have her. Would you all join me in welcoming Leslie Appleton Young? Good morning, Les. Good morning, Phil, and good morning, everyone. It's so nice to see all your smiling faces, and there's 228 people here, which is amazing. So um, good morning. I had no idea that in addition to Southern California, we have Bakersfield represented. So welcome to the Bakersfield um, contingent. And uh, I, I think most of my slides are Southern California, so I would be more than happy to um, send you some um, Bakersfield slides after the after the program. So let's just get in touch with uh, uh, in touch with each other. So um, with that, Phil, thank you very much for the invitation. I've been doing this um, for several uh, years now. I always look forward to coming to your office because it's right down the street from my alma mater, Wilson High School. So it's always a, a trip down memory lane. So anyway, great to be here. And I'm going to share my screen right now. And we can start with um, all of the, the slides that I have uh, put together. And I hope they are uh, helpful. Hold on just one second. Let me get this going. Um, let me start here and there we go. So um, good morning, Coldwell Banker from wherever you are in, um, in Southern California. Um, how's everybody doing? Uh, it's been, I gotta tell you, it's not the 2020 that um, I think any of us, uh, any of us expected. And here we are, we're all home alone, you know, it's like who would have, uh, who would have guessed, you know, we started 2020 and really fairly strong economic shape. We had the uh, lowest um, unemployment rate in over 50 years, a 3.5% um, all-time low. Uh, in February, home sales in California were up um, on a year-over-year -year basis quite, quite sharply, and uh, median home prices were up 8% on a year-over-year -year basis. And then, boom, uh, in the middle of March, we started to get the um, uh, concerns about the pandemic and the shelter in place orders and, and there we were. So it's really been a, a period where I will, I will just speak my, for myself. I think I've gone all the way from denial and acceptance in the last six or uh, seven weeks. And I feel that in the marketplace as well. And I'm, I'm actually delighted to be able to speak this week when I have data that shows that we are um, at least for now bottoming out um, and starting to see some green shoots in terms of new listings, in terms of pendings, um, in large part driven by the relaxation of the shelter uh, in place orders um, around, around the state. And we're clearly not out of the woods, but I think there has been a tremendous amount of um, ad uh, adaptation to doing remote, um, more remote transactions and the fact that we're now able to show property, obviously under the strictest um, standards for safety and um, health concerns, um, I think is really helping a lot. So I'm feeling more optimistic today than I was, let's say, um, a month ago. Um, just in terms of our, um, our industry, um, uh, you know, Phil's on our board of directors and I, I don't think this would surprise him. We have a very, um, diverse group of realtors in California. So when we asked what what worries you more, you know, we're gonna 
loosen too quickly. We're going to take too long to loosen, or I don't know. We were split a third, a third, a third. So there is a tremendous um, diversity uh, in opinion compared to the public as a whole. This is probably a little bit skewed towards the um, take too long to loosen restrictions, but for, for the most part, I think reflects um, the public, uh, the public at large, just very, a lot of uncertainty surrounding what we're uh, going through. We also asked if you're worried about your um, immediate uh, family and the, um, uh, you know, 26% were either very or extremely uh, worried and the remaining um, uh, 75 percent were either moderately um, moderately or less so that's kind of just to take the temperature of how everybody is doing uh, okay. right now as we get going into May um, May of 2020 so what I'm going to be doing is just organizing remarks um, along the lines of some really basic questions like what's happening in the economy how is the government responding what about mortgages and what about the California market what about the Southern California uh, market? How are realtors uh, reacting and adapting and seeing uh, market conditions? You know, how soon are we going to recover and what's it going to look like? And then finally, what should I be doing now to prepare? And I think this is really important. You know, when you know you look at this as they're calling it the great pause. Am I using that time to think about what might be different? when we get out of the other side of this and how might I be able to um, take advantage of those opportunities and provide that information to my clients. So that's kind of what we're gonna do as we go down this uh, journey over the next um, 45 minutes. So um, let's look at the economy. We got the bad news we were expecting uh, last week with a drop in first quarter GDP of 4.8%. It was uh, almost a full percentage point uh, more negative than the consensus forecast, and it essentially reverses the 10-year uh, economic recovery that we celebrated um, about a year ago. And essentially, you have an economy that has come not to a full stop, but in many areas, it has come to almost a complete uh, stop, and that is reverberating through the economy. Now, 70% of GDP is tied to consumer uh, consumer spending. So as you look at the, the jobs data and the ramifications of that for the ability of consumers to not only have the income to spend, but the ability to go out and, and spend with the shelter in place orders, it really all starts to make um, some sense. In California, we're losing about 31.5% of our GDP output every single day. Uh, with the with the current uh, shelter in place um, orders, and here's a look at at really the trail of tears, if you will, or the big. I don't even. I guess you would call this a hockey stick, but we have in the last six weeks in this country had over 30 million people apply for unemployment insurance in six weeks during the Great Recession. Of, uh, of 10 years ago. In two years, we had 37 million people apply. That took two years. So that really differentiates the experience we're having right now. It is not anywhere near what you might consider a normal recession. It looks much more like a, a natural disaster, right, that comes out of nowhere and boom, um, people, are, um, people are out of work. Also, um, in, 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 20, um, in 2020, we're looking at an unemployment rate that is going to be well in excess of 20%. The um, April jobs report will be coming out on Friday, and we are, we are expecting to see that, um, uh, that, that kind of number. And the, most, uh, the highest the unemployment rate, rate reached in uh, 2010 was 12.3%, so much more severe in terms of its impact on on consumers, here's a look at what happened to jobless claims in Louisiana during Hurricane Katrina. So you can see why I'm making that analogy to a uh, natural uh, disaster. 
Um, the stock market's been uh, been interesting. We had a huge, huge drop um, after it reached a peak. I believe it was on February um, 12th. It's now um, it's now done a, a significant amount of recovery. The S and P is only down about only quote unquote down about 12 percent uh, for the year. But it's it's really important to remember that the stock market is not the economy, and investors at this point are being um, on the optimistic side of the ability, looking at the ability of the of the government, you know, Congress, the President, and the Fed, to navigate um, our way through this quickly and with as little damage to the economy uh, economy as uh, possible. The other thing you have happening um, is PE ratios didn't look like 2000, uh, 1919, but they were getting a little bit. Um, a little bit heady. So you had the venture capital um, money flowing into companies, startups that look good from a growth perspective. And the attitude was, we'll worry about profits later. Let's just get this, um, get this train going. And that's what they've been doing. And of course, now that we've had this big shock uh, to the economy, there's just a lot of, a lot of pain in those areas and a lot of coming back, um, uh, coming back down to earth and a lot of looking for uh, for true profits, if at all, um, if at all possible. Now, even though the stock market is not the economy, it does have a significant impact on attitudes about the economy and wealth for uh, for Americans that have um, that have portfolios. So that's why kind of the upper end luxury uh, end of the market has tended to be. Uh, more directly impacted. Although, as we've looked at some of our survey research, which I will be uh, sharing with you, uh, when we look at the verbatims of buyers that have had to pull out, the loss of um, portfolio, uh, a portfolio they can dip into either themselves or their parents to help them with the down payment, uh, was not infrequently mentioned as a reason why they had to um, upend their search for a home. Uh, we also saw in the April data um, over a 30 point decline in consumer confidence. You know, no, no, no surprise there. We also saw a record drop in, in retail sales, uh, a drop of 8.7% on a month to month basis. On a year over year annualized basis, that drop was over 65%. So just a huge, um, huge pullback. And there are winners and losers. Um, people are buying half the clothing and accessories they were before, although there are some growth areas, and I'm not kidding, I did read this, yoga pants and sweatshirts are doing, um, are, are down, but they're not down nearly as much as everything else. So this work from home environment has really uh, fueled a search for, um, or a search for comfort, but we're not buying, we're not buying cars, we're not going out to restaurants, we're not buying of furniture, we are buying food and beverage, and there has been a, um, a, a, spar a, a spike in demand for um, hard liquor. So there's a lot of cocktail parties going on um, on Zoom, and there's a lot more cooking going on at at home. So that's uh, why you've got that food and beverage uh, category up uh, over 20 25 percent. The sad part about the uh, decline in gas station um, expenditures is that here we have really historic lows in terms of gas prices, and you can't really drive anywhere. I mean, you can drive around, but you can't really go anywhere, and you can't really fly anywhere. So we can't, you know, usually a big drop in oil prices would precipitate economic activity, right? As people took advantage of that, they traded in their Prius and bought an SUV and so on. But that's not happening this time because you're not allowed to uh, to go um, to go out. So again, just to drive home the point about um, consumers, consumer spending in the first quarter was down 5.3%. It was by far the biggest component a drop in um, drop in economic activity, and again, tied to that huge, um, huge job loss. So just, I won't read this, but just every measure you look at has been um, really just unimaginable, unimaginable as this huge behemoth of an economy that was chugging along pretty well has just come to um, what I would call a pause. And I think that's the way to uh, look at it. This hasn't been a gradual in, um, it has just been overnight, boom, 
um, we are we are stopping. So certainly, when you look at the real estate market uh, in California, at least from the you know the aggregate higher level data that that I look at, we January and February were looking great. The fourth quarter actually had a, a recovery or a rebound in sales of luxury property. And I was thinking, wow, 2020 is really going to be a strong year. And then, as I said, in the middle of March, things changed uh, dramatically. So, you know, the economy just hit um, hit the pause button. Here's just a few other um, data from Open Table showing the drop um, in um, uh, seated diners. Here's a look at hotels, so travel, um, hospitality, uh, Airbnb, as you probably saw this morning, has uh, laid off a quarter of their um, workforce and are really redefining what they do to focus on safety and focus on travel that's closer to home. Um, airline passenger volumes are down 95% and uh, grocery delivery is up. So Instacart and all of those, um, um, all of those uh, things are, are doing fine. Um, this slide is just a kind of a compilation of where the various um, entities that do, uh, that do the GDP forecasting are. There's a, a similarity in terms of the second quarter being the biggest drop. And I will tell you the consensus is around the minus 30% um, mark on a year over year um, basis. And as you go down the columns, you can see everybody's looking at an improvement in Q3 and Q4. The um, extent of the improvement depends dramatically on the assumptions that are made in terms of how quickly the economy can come back to speed and what the post-COVID world looks like. You know, how much social distancing will there be? And and part of it is the rules and regulations that are in place as we phase our way um, out of a complete shelter in place. But the other part that we don't really know is how, how soon co consumers um, are gonna feel comfortable resuming a pub public life and what that is going to, uh, to look like. So that in a very truncated um, nutshell is where we, where we are with the um, with the economy, um, NAR came out a few days ago with their with their forecast for 2020. They are looking at a minus four and a half percent decline in GDP for the year as a whole. So that's going to be some improvement, right? some recovery in the second half, and for a three percent growth rate in. Uh, in 2021. So what's the government doing? So they've got a couple of different level uh, levers, if you will. And fiscal policy has been quick. Um, it has been large. It dwarfs anything that was done um, during the Great Recession. Uh, so far, we have had four major bills starting March 6th and ending with the increase in the Paycheck um, Protection Program that you know, ran out of money in less than two weeks the first time around. So this last bill was on April 24th. And there is likely to be um, more, uh, more stimulus coming. Um, some people like to make the point that the CARES Act was more a relief bill, not a stimulus, uh, not a stimulus bill. Uh, but given the um, response so far in terms of the economy, it looks like we're going to need more but Congress certainly will not be united on what they think that should look like or if we should see that um, at all. The CARES Act was the one that, and I'm sure you, I won't go into detail here, but um, you know, you've had, a, a, you know, the SBA loans, the um, PUA assistance that became available to independent contractors for the first time and the forms were available Tuesday morning, uh, last Tuesday morning um, in California through the EDD in Sacramento and then direct, uh, direct payments. When you look at small businesses, um, it's shocking and startling just how thin the margins, uh, margins are. And for restaurants, JP Morgan uh, estimates that they have about 16 days uh, worth of um, buffer, which clearly is is long gone, as we're now in the eighth and ninth week um, week of this. 
On the other uh, side, if you will, are real estate offices, which really made me happy to see that that, that um, our industry was towards the um, the higher end here. But clearly, there's just a tremendous amount of um, of pain of pain there and relief that's needed. Um, what about monetary policy? Well, you really cannot fault the Fed. They have done absolutely everything uh, in their power. They learned. Uh, they learned last time and they now know how to fight the last war. So, you know, rates are down. They're signaling to the markets that rates will stay uh, very low. They are doing everything they can to pump liquidity uh, into, into the system, to buy mortgage-backed securities, to buy, buy commercial mortgage-backed securities, to make regulations less onerous. They even gave Wells Fargo um, a bit of a break uh, from the cap on their their growth and said, please be part of the uh, solution. So the Fed's been very, very um, active. I think one of the big concerns um, really on the that I'm that I'm hearing is concerns about um, inflation. And I will say right now at this point in uh, in the situation we're in, that is not a major uh, concern. In fact, with the drop in oil prices, we saw the CPI actually come down uh, to one and a half percent. Concerns about inflation were also top of mind during the Great Recession, but most of that stimulus ended up being held as excess reserves by banks, and that's what's happening this time too. So the piper will need to be paid. It just is not top of mind right now. Um, right now. And here's just a look at what's happened to, um, to oil prices. Very, very interesting. So should I be worried about the mortgage market? And I am a little bit worried about the mortgage market. Um, in California, we were down 34% on a year-over-year -year basis um, by the third week in April in terms of new applications, not refinances, but new applications. We were down significantly more than the country, um, than the country um, as a whole. The good news is though, it looks like we have hit bottom. And even though we're below, we're still negative compared to where we were a year ago, it's starting to come back up, right? We're starting to see more, um, more um, ap applications. So that's, that's a positive thing. So that's kind of the state of the market. Um, but what what am I can what am I concerned about? Um, one of the things is that um, forbearance is available for anyone with a government um, guaranteed either explicit or implicit loan. So Fannie, Freddie, FHA, um, FHA, and VA. But it does not mean that those loans are are forgiven. So that's really one of the concerns. And what happens when when this money becomes due. Well, we now know that there has been a ruling that they, they will not be balloon payments, but there will be some kind of a, uh, an agreement, the term extended, um, whatever that, um, that might be. Um, there may need to be a, a loan modification. These are things that need to be um, adjusted on a on a case by case basis, but it's really kicking the can down the road. The other thing you see here is just the huge increase, um, almost a 1900% increase in the second half of March in requests for mortgage, uh, more mortgage forbearance. So currently there are about, um, I think, uh, 5 million um, homeowners that have taken advantage of that. Now here is the, um, here is the concern. Um, the concern is that services, servicers are caught in the middle, and these are primarily non-bank, or many of them are non-bank financial institutions. And here's the problem. They have investors who have purchased mortgage-backed securities that still need to be paid, and yet they are looking at this wave of payment deferments and forbearance, that means they still um, need to be paid. Excuse me, I had to shut, um, I had to shut the door real quick. Um, so they're kind of caught in the middle, right? The investors still wanna be paid, and yet here the revenue that are that is flowing in 
um, is is being um, is being compromised. Now they did have some good news um, uh, at the um, uh, on April 21st, where their FHFA said they're only responsible for four months of missing payments. That's principal and interest instead of 12. But I don't think that's going to really solve their uh, solve their problem if a lot of homeowners get. Um, get into trouble. And what they would really like to see is a liquidity facility that would purchase um, purchase these uh, purchase these assets. And right now that isn't isn't happening. The other issue is that jumbo loans, um, exotic loans, anything that doesn't fit into kind of the conforming um, box, if you will, um, are really struggling. There's no market for them. Investors are not interested in risky assets right now because they're too risky, right? Um, so that's kind of where my my concerns are right now in terms of, of the market. And you have seen credit uh, tightening up. The verification of income uh, windows have gotten much, um, much stricter. Uh, for self-employed, it's within the last 10 days, if you can believe that. And even, um, even for um, like conforming loans, uh, JP Morgan wants a minimum FICO score of 700 and a 20% down payment and a preference for dealing with existing bank customers. So not um, a, a huge issue yet, but it's certainly something that we're watching uh, very, very carefully to make sure that this doesn't uh, become a, a bigger problem. And here, again, you can see the curves here of the um, portfolios that are um, have a home homeowners that are uh, in forbearance. So anyway, that's just kind of like the foundation here. Let's see what's happening in the market. We do a poll uh, every month where we ask if it's a good time to buy, is it a good time to sell? And we just did it last weekend for May. And the May data was encouraging. We had an increase in both of those responses from 1,000 California consumers um, with 31% saying it's a good time to buy and 29% saying it's a good time to sell. And notice between um, uh, in March and April, the huge drop in a uh, good time to sell. So a real uh, concern on the part of sellers uh, with having their homes on the market. How are they going to show it? Do they want people uh, in their home? Are buyers going to be looking for discounts? You know, just probably not the best time. So even though we've seen um, demand compromised by the loss and potential loss of income and ability to qualify for loans, the supply side has fallen um, has fallen even even more. So this is another thing that. Um, differentiates the situation we're in right now from where we were um, during the Great um, Recession. Um, another kind of so <clears throat> sign of change here is from showing time, uh, showing the narrowing gap uh, between last year and this year um, in, in showing. So the 2020 weekly average is down about 27%, but it was down over 60% at the end of March. So that to me is, a, um, is an encouraging sign. Uh, the March data was down both month to month and year over year. That is just a precursor for a drop of close to 30% statewide that we are expecting. We're running the numbers uh, right now. And I think the preliminary estimate that I was given was a drop of 27%. So it could be, could be a little bit um, more, more than that. But, you know, in March, again, the first two weeks were fairly normal and you had closings in the second half that were transactions that were negotiated and put into escrow um, in, in February and maybe even um, even January. So you can see just at the end there how good January and February looked and then we got into March. Um, on the price side, um, prices, and I remember saying this 12 years ago, prices tend to be sticky on the way down, right? Sellers don't have to, um, don't have to sell. So even in March, we saw um, California's median home price up over 8% on a year-over-year -year basis. And even though we're expecting some softening 
um, this year in, in prices, nothing that even approaches the 60% drop in the median home price that we saw um, we saw back, um, we saw back um, then. Um, and the reason is because inventories are very tight. In fact, a big, a significant drop in inventory, our unsold inventory index um, from March of 2019 to 2.7 months in, in, in 2020. We also saw, and I mentioned the expectation of a drop in sales in April statewide of um, about 30%. We did have a, a significant drop in um, in, in pendings um, as, as well. So um, I don't have a single point forecast to give you for the market this year. What we are doing is looking at scenarios and I just thought I would give you one, one scenario. And this is that the stay at home order for the state is lifted on May 15th and there is no second wave expected in the fall. And there's, I think of certainly the, you know, TV, you know, the, the experts are saying, don't be surprised if there's a second wave, but if we, you know, take the biggest hit quarterly sales down and here the estimate for the quarter is a drop of about 35%, 34.7%. Um, if we start, um, you know, bouncing back in the second half of the year, the annual sales decline will be down about 16.7%. Um, by by way of comparison, NAR's forecast is for a 13 and a half percent drop nationwide. So this is pretty much um, on par with the relationship that California typically has with um, with the with the uh, national numbers, and they are projecting an increase, actually a slight increase in the median home price of 1.3 percent. We're projecting under this scenario a drop of 3.3. Uh, 3.7%. So um, I've I've sent Phil these slides, and um, you know I'm sure you'll they'll be distributed to everyone. We'll also put them on our market data uh, section in our our website for you to see. But you know just the assumptions that we're um, we're making are really tied to the, uh, the path of the virus and the response in terms of the shelter in place orders. That that's really the determinant. Um, here. So let's talk a little bit about uh, where we are with closed sales in Southern California. This is weekly data. We are actually looking at MLS data from the, from the entire state. We get a, um, a feed and we are looking at the data on a daily basis and calculating per week the average daily closed sales. And I'm just going to talk about Southern California here um, because we we have a, a limited uh, a limited time. So the first week in March, um, we had 325 um, was the average daily closed sales. You can see in Southern California that there was an increase um, between the week of the 19th and the week of the 26th, and we are up to 253 average daily closed uh, closed sales. This is a look at the percentage change. And that um, uh, last week in Southern California, we had a 10.1% increase um, week to week in average daily closed sales. So this is one of the um, one of the things I'm optimistic about. So even though we've got a big loss coming in the April data, we will also be down statewide in the May data. I'm looking at the weekly changes and seeing an encouraging um, sign. And every region, um, uh, not every region was up. SoCal was up, Central Coast was up, uh, the state was up, Bay Area was still down, and the Central Valley was still down. So a lot of diversity um, within regions of the state. Um, here's a look at uh, closed sales by county. Um, in, in LA, we were up to, we bounced up to 70 average daily closed sales. In Orange County, we dipped a little bit from 31 to 30 average closed sales. In Riverside, big bump up from 42 to 55, up in, in San Bernardino, flat in San Diego and up from nine to 12, again, average daily, right? 
um, in Ventura. And so here are the percentage changes with LA up 9.7%. And you can, um, you can see what the others are. So um, some optimism there in terms of the uh, uh, closed sales. And here's all the data in a, in a chart. What about pending sales? Because uh, pending sales is the precursor, right, of, of closed sales. And in Southern California, this last week was the second week that we have seen um, an increase uh, to 284. So pendings are definitely significantly down from the 369 we had in the first week in March, but they're coming up and they're coming up. It was a 3.4% uh, increase for Southern California. Here's a look at the breakout by county uh, in Southern California. And again, a, a lot of diversity, LA, uh, Riverside, and San Diego being the three counties that have seen the, seen the you know, strongest two, two week um, uh, increase. And in LA County, it was an uh, increase of six point um, 6.7% in Riverside, 7.8%, and in San Diego, 3.5%. So weekly, weekly data here. What about um, new listings, right? Because new listings are really, really important to, um, uh, um, you know, feed into the process, uh, if you will, to have more, um, more closing. So um, in Southern California, you have seen now the third week in a row where new listings are going going up. Another reason for my optimism, the increase in Southern California was 22.1%. Uh, uh, um, and here you can see just for, every, for all of the counties that are represented um, on this call, except for Kern County, and my, uh, my apologies um, on that, but but certainly um, room for um, optimism in LA. It was a 25% weekly gain. In Orange, it was a 30% weekly gain in new listings. Riverside, 15.2, uh, 14.6 in San Bernardino, 27.1 in San Diego, 10.4 in Ventura. So please you know, understand and make your clients understand that real estate is open for business. It looks different, it's transacted differently, but it is being uh, done, and we're seeing it quite sharply here um, in those, um, in all of those, um, in all of those numbers. I had, I had just two cities that I, I just wanted to um, be accountable to you and show you what the, uh, what the daily, what it looks like when you're looking at a daily MLS data for a city. So here, are closed sales in Long Beach. Here are pending sales, and you can see uh, you can see the weekends there in Torrance. Here are closed sales. Here are pending sales in Long Beach. Here are the active listings, and you can see that general uh, trend up and the new listings. And in Torrance, active listings and new listings. So I I got to tell you, I have an amazing staff of researchers back at CAR, and between Jordan and Oscar and Guillermo, they just do a phenomenal job with these numbers. It was a very quick pivot to, um, to go from one download a month, right, to look at the data, to doing it on a, on a daily basis. The other thing we've done is we've really upped our survey research a game and the data I'm going to show you now is from a weekly survey that we are doing every single week. We send it out on a Friday, we close it on a Monday night, and it's questions. There's some core questions, and then we kind of mix it up. Asking realtors in California, we we send it out to 20, uh, 20,000 realtors. And right now we're getting maybe 600 responses. And I know that probably sounds horrible, but it's actually not from a survey research perspective. We're really, um, we're really pretty happy. So we asked them, you know, do you think you'll be negatively impacted? And that, you know, that number is, you know, as you can imagine, very, very high. We asked them specific parts of the transaction and the biggest hit clearly is, understandably, is open house traffic and sales. I love the fact that market competition is below 50%. And I think that's, to me, that's the entrepreneurial spirit in our industry. And the idea that if other people are having trouble, 
working this market. I can do it. This is an advantage for me. I'm going to take this as an opportunity. And I'm, I really am, um, that really makes me um, smile. We know that clients are um, holding back either because of uncertainty or because of a change in their financial um, financial situation. So a little bit of a ramp up, but now it's it's pretty much nine out of 10 of the realtors saying that. And buyers are actually even that are in the process of, um, you know, getting into a contract are pulling back or withdrawing their offers. About four out of 10 of the realtors said that, yeah, I'm having that um, I'm having that experience. And about half of them said, I've had a seller remove the home from, um, <clears throat> from the market. So both buyers and sellers are being um, impacted. Three out of 10 said they'd have a transaction fall, um, fall out of um, escrow. So what has the impact on prices been? And I think you will understand this is in context to the data I've already shown you. Really nothing. I mean, nothing yet. Um, sellers are not, um, are not, um, are, are not discounting. Um, price per square, this is a price per square foot um, data comparing the beginning of March to where we were at the beginning of May. SoCal and the Central Valley were up. The Bay Area and the Central Coast were down, but not, um, but not significantly. So we're monitoring that um, very carefully, in part because there seems to be a gap in expectations between buyers and sellers. Buyers, um, the last week we did this, 87% of the realtors said, my buyer is expecting lower prices. And then we asked, have any of your sellers reduced their price? And there was actually a drop between the middle of April and the end, with only 30% of the realtors saying, yes, my, my home, um, my seller has decided to reduce their price. So that's a, a gap that I know you've experienced many times in your careers, and it is, um, it is back. 24% said in the last week of data that they'd had a buyer attempt to renegotiate um, the price. And yet here we look at the original price um, listings and the discounted listings, and there has been absolutely no change as of yet. Um, and this, this starts in the, on, on March 8th in the share of discounted listings and the share of um, non-discounted um, discounted listings. Um, we've also seen a tremendous amount of adaptation to the new world. 57% have said, yes, I am definitely doing more virtual um, virtual home um, home uh, home tours. Um, sorry, I should have deleted um, those. Um, we also asked, have you had a buyer put a contract on a home without seeing it? And I I just was curious. You know, I I actually have some um, agent one uh, one of my friends who's an agent said she did the entire transaction virtually, and 13% of those who um, uh, had a transaction close said, yes, I have had that um, experience. So it's, it's doable. I, we also asked, are your listings vacant? Because in some areas of the state, half of the properties listed on the MLS are vacant. And 55% said, yes, I have vacant listings. And 43% of those said that they vacated prior to listing to facilitate showing. So that's one of the things I'm wondering, are we going to see more vacant listings in the future, even when we don't maybe aren't under the, the threat of the, um, of, of the virus. Um, then for those that had 56% um, said they had transactions closed since this all started and 61% of those said, yes, I've had some problems. And a lot of those problems really had to do for the most part of uh, financing. Um, that has been the biggest um, biggest problem, and I don't think that's any different than than the pre-COVID world. Uh, world, and then finally, um, this I think is going to be a huge concern um, everywhere, but particularly in California, where uh, landlords are are dealing with the um, the um, rent control measures that were passed uh, last year. So we asked, if you're a property manager, have you seen any tenants? unable to pay their rent. And 68%, two thirds said yes. 
So this is, um, you know, understandable that renters need relief, but what about the, the small uh, property owner, the small investor who has more, a mortgage to pay? What is going to be available for, for them? So moving on, um, I'm almost done. Uh, what will the recovery look like? So the short answer to that is, I don't know, <laughs> but I'm going to give it my best shot. I um, Initially, when we looked at how sharp the down was, and there was a lot less information out there about the path of the virus and the policy response, um, a lot of talk about a V. Um, there are all kinds of shapes that, that it could be, but my guess right now is it's going to be a little bit more like a swoosh, partly because of the unevenness at which, um, uh, at which the you know, different states and different localities within a given state um, remove the shelter in place orders. And the other part that's unknown is just how consumers, um, consumers will, uh, will behave. Um, I, I wanted to share a, a quote from Steve Murray in, his, um, in the Real Trends uh, newsletter that came out yesterday. He does an excellent job of looking at past housing market recessions and recoveries. And he says, I'd love to think that this will be a V housing recovery, but if it is, it will be the first in the last 40 years. When you look at history, recessionary shocks typically unnerve consumers, especially when it comes to housing. Recoveries are often drawn out over years not months. And then he goes on to say, but this time it could be different. So it, it's, it's a wonderful, um, it's a wonderful um, article. And it really is the point I initially made, which I, which is, I think that this is going to be, um, you know, there's, there's just a lot of uncertainty. One thing we do know is that curve in California has been flattened. Uh, the, um, the shelter in place um, orders have have definitely worked and it is looking we're not out of the woods but the woods aren't looking nearly as dark as they did so um, what should I be doing now to prepare for uh, the future and that can even be what to prepare for in the second half of 2020 or even what to prepare for excuse me as I look at um, as I look at, at June, you know, as I look at the near um, future. And it's really, really important to do strategic planning for your business um, today. Um, you may have a little bit more time to think, um, think strategically, uh, to read, but by all accounts, the world is going to look, look different. Um, I think this is a time to really um, really up your um, up your game and see what those opportunities are and just you know take some uh, take some risks I think for the most part what we are seeing is an acceleration of trends that were already there and what do I what do I mean by that um, and uh, I'm sorry this is a little bit out of order so let me come back to that in a minute I think in terms of the real estate business we have had technology tools available for a long time, but the incentive to adopt them hasn't been there because for the most part, the old way of doing things has really worked. And some of the, um, some of the realtors that, that love technology or their digital natives have come in and um, you know, just been, been with the videos and been with the virtual tours and all of that. Um, all of that stuff and the e-signatures and some really haven't because they haven't had to but in this environment you really you really have to there isn't a there isn't a choice anymore I think that so that's that's one of the changes certainly the work from home environment for consumers and for agents um, I don't think we'll ever go back to where we were I think we will go back a little bit but a smaller footprint for offices, I think, is almost um, guaranteed. I also see opportunities to take this Zoom environment to be more impactful with information that you share with your clients. Um, 
I will just use CAR as an example. We went full virtual literally in a week and have been having, you know, I'm, I'm zoomed out, but it's, I feel closer to my, my, um, my staff and to the people that I work with than I ever have, you know, we are, and part of it is the, you know, the crisis environment and really having a, a purpose, but part of it is just having this really regular communication with people that aren't stressed out from, from a commute, you know, um, certainly there's some that want to get back to work and it's mostly people with small children, <laughs> but for, for many of the, the workers, this has been a, a plus. So um, I think there's there's opportunities there. Uh, certainly, at all of the digital all of the digital tools and the paperless transaction. I think we're going to see just a leapfrog in terms of um, in terms of that um, reality. I also look at the um, office and retail properties as just you know this part of the market is going to be devastated and. The retail environment has been under pressure for for quite some time. Uh, the office market, as well, you know, as as people have been um, telecommuting and and working from home, but this has just accelerated it. So I think you're going to have a huge um, a huge footprint of square footage that's going to be available. I think we also could see some um, uh, real estate investors. Uh, particularly, as I mentioned, in California, where it is not a fun environment to be um, to own a investment uh, investment property, as the regulations are getting so uh, so onerous. So that could be um, a, a change that we see, and we may see a reduction in foreign buyers, in part because this retreat from globalization that's been going on um, for for several years around the globe, not just in the United States, may may make people feel less welcome or less able to bring money into the country and buy and buy a property. So those are a few things to look at. The, the slide I wanted to cover um, next is just in terms of consumer behavior, what we are seeing is saving more, spending less. And, you know, we've talked about this before, you know, that, that people don't want things as much as they want experiences. And I think that will accelerate. But what's coming now in tandem with that is this, this nesting, right? Where, have, where has everybody been for the last seven weeks? They have been home. And many of them are working from home for the first time. And not only are they enjoying huge aspects of it, but their bosses are seeing that, oh my goodness, people aren't sitting at home watching TV and eating bonbons. They are actually more productive than they were when they were in the office. So, wow, I need a different space. I need to do something to, to kind of further adopt this lifestyle. I think we also could see um, a resurgence in suburban, um, in suburban living as there is a, a premium placed on feeling safe and having more open space and less uh, less density, or the density that we see is townhomes, you know, where people have control over their front door as opposed to, you know, getting in um, an elevator or sharing um, a sharing um, a lobby. You know, there there might be some changes uh, there, but but certainly a, a tremendous opportunity to reset a relationship with with consumers who are. Um, more than ever, seeing um, how important it is to have a space that really um, that really supports them. Um, I I think the winners are going to be the tech enabled agent, the and I think I've said enough about that. The relationship centered agent. This pandemic is a gift in terms of an opportunity to connect with your sphere and your former clients and just see how they're doing. Because as much as we talk about this industry being relationship, a relationship business, consumers, you know, when you survey consumers, they feel like they're, they're not as important after the close of escrow because they don't hear from their agent. So what a great opportunity to kind of restructure that, um, that relationship. I think residential real estate is going to come out of this in a very strong position. It was, you know, I spoke in Beverly Hills 
last Tuesday and on Monday they loosened the requirements and created the ability to show um, occupied homes again. And what I was hearing from them is they were absolutely jammed with, um, with calls and, and real estate business going on. So I think the pent up demand and the pent up supply coupled with very low, uh, low rates. So that affordability um, advantage coupled with the psychic change in how a home is viewed is going to be really, really positive. And I also think the um, overhang of commercial and retail space can be used as a once in a generation opportunity to create affordable housing. And I hope we don't blow that. I know the Strategic Planning and Finance Committee at CAR has been talking about that, um, that all year. And we need a, a game plan for the industry to be prepared to facilitate that transaction because it just makes so much, um, so much sense. And uh, my, my, my hope would be that the community groups and the neighborhood organizations would not be threatened by taking an empty mall and turning it into, um, into a, um, a residential uh, village with lots of, of parking. So, you know, don't be afraid to get out of your comfort zone because we're all out of our comfort zone now. This is all um, uncharted uh, territory. I'm going to end, as I always do, with some book recommendations. These three books are not new. They are three of, you know, as I'm looking back on my career, you know, as this is my last year, I'm, I'm thinking about the books that have had the biggest impact on me. And, and these three really, really have to do with um, being an active, an active listener um, by having a diverse um, sounding board and by realizing that the conversations that you are least excited about making are really the most important ones. And then finally, here are the two books that we are reading in the strategic um, uh, finance and planning, uh, strategic planning and finance committee at, um, at CAR. And I'm just getting into both of them, so I don't have a book review, but I'm, I'm always um, interested in, in reading and hearing what people that are, um, you know, always hire people smarter than you and always read books from people that um, have, a, have an expertise. It's, uh, I think it's important. So with that, I hope I'm okay on, on time. And um, I am going to stop sharing my screen. And if there are any questions, um, I hope you're still awake. <laughs> I can answer Leslie, them. Leslie, thank you very much. As always, uh, very detailed, great, uh, great information. Do you feel residential rates will go down post COVID? Yes, I do. I do. I think there'll be the mar the um, investors in the market will be feeling a, a lot more grounded, right? Because the economy will have come back. And the Fed, as, as I said, their forward guidance has assured that they are looking at keeping the rate environment low as lo as low as it could be as long as it takes to be sure that we are that we are out of the woods. So I think we could see even lower um, lower rates. That's in our uh, in our forecast, and that is always a positive for us. Great, thanks. Do we do we have any other questions? Because we just have yes. a couple of minutes left. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, 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 Lydia Gutierrez. I'm yes, asking, may I? Yes, please. please. Okay, thank you. And first of all, excellent, excellent. I really would, I love this information. And, uh, I'm sorry I went on a little long. You know, I don't care. You know what? <laughs> it was, I love it. Thank you. And is there any way, so I was trying to actually try to get a little my notes without missing what you were saying. Is there any way I could get this printed out? We have we have the slides that we'll be we'll share those with everybody. Okay. Right, and Phil, I'm going to make a few edits and send you a fresh one. So don't do it quite okay. yet. Hey, okay. Thank um, you. Thank Les you. Leslie, in the in the interest of time, I think we probably can can field one question, Phil, if that's okay with you, just to get everybody out of here in the hour. And, and you know what, my my email is Leslie A at car org, and I if I can't answer it, someone on my staff well, can. I, I think this is a good question, and this was um, asked by Jennifer Peterson, and she basically said, you had a lot about the stats and the units and all that sort of stuff, but 
have you seen anything on what price point seems to be moving? Like, so in your stats, again, it was units, but is there any particular price point that seems to be moving more than others? You know, I, honestly, I don't know, and I haven't seen that data, and I'm going to ask um, my research um, my research team um, what they what they think, because um, I I kind of the impression I had is it was kind of across the board, but maybe it's not. So let me get and I'll 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 get back to Phil with the answer on that because that's an excellent question. All right. Awesome. Right. We have, we we have run out of time. We want to uh, respect everybody's time, particularly Leslie. I know she has a meeting in probably thirty minutes, uh, in a in a day full of them. She, by the way, she had reported she's in Florida, uh, and we want to uh, thank you for spending your time with us, Leslie. It's always it's always great. It's melancholy because, as Leslie said, this is her last year after 37 years with uh, the California Association of Realtors. We're gonna miss her terribly. Okay. With that, thank you everybody. Have a Bye, great everyone. Day. Be healthy. Leslie, hello to John and be healthy. Thank Thanks, you. John.